Hey guys, welcome back. Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and Mob24. Today, we're talking about one of the most common things that I see as a gynecologist, and that is fibroids. We'll go over what they are, what causes them, who gets them, what problems they cause, and how you treat them in this video. Fibroids, also called uterine leiomyomas, are benign muscle growths in the uterus. They can occur in a variety of places. So when we look at a uterus, there's the inside, like where the baby would grow if you were pregnant. Then there's the inside layer closest to that, which is the shedding part during your cycle. And then there's the thick muscular part of the uterus and the outside layer, which is like a shiny layer that covers most organs. Those are kind of the different places that a fibroid could be. Submucosal, which is on the very inside near that layer where a embryo would implant if you were pregnant. Intramural, which is embedded in the thick muscle part of the uterus. They can be subserosal, which is kind of superficial and covered by that shiny layer that I was talking about. And then they can also be what we call pedunculated, which is just attached to the uterus by like a stalk. So on that serosal shiny edge inside the abdomen, they can grow a tiny stalk and then they can be there. Rarely, they may also be located other places, but the general definitions and locations are the ones we just described. Who gets fibroids? Pretty much anyone with a uterus can get a fibroid. And the general population estimates are about 50 to 70 percent of people over the course of their lifetime will have a fibroid at some point. It's more common in people who are black than people who are white for a variety of reasons that we don't fully understand. Most likely this is kind of a genetic and environmental overlap, which is what we call multifactorial, meaning that some people probably are genetically more inclined to get fibroids than they are in an environment that allows those fibroids to develop. Why do they happen? We're not really sure what the answer to this is. It does seem like there's some family component, but there's also environmental links that we found. One of the most interesting to me is being looked at right now, and that is vitamin D deficiency predisposing people to fibroids. I think this one is super interesting because if it turned out that there was a link here, this would be something that we could study as a preventative measure, making sure you don't get vitamin D deficient if you are at an increased risk or predisposed to fibroids in general and seeing if that lowered your risk in the long term. It's also being studied right now in animal models as a treatment for fibroids, so that's super cool to me. Another really interesting link that we found is with exercise. Some studies actually say that regular exercise can help prevent fibroids. This is not completely understood, but there is some interesting research on it, and that is just, in my opinion, one more reason to make sure you are being physically fit and exercising regularly. So how do I know I have a fibroid? What are the symptoms? That's a really tough question to answer because fibroids can be completely asymptomatic, meaning you don't have any symptoms at all. You don't even know they're there, or they can cause really heavy, painful, clotty, long periods, or in some situations they can get very large or be in just the right place to cause what we call bulk symptoms or a feeling of pressure in the pelvis. Or, you know, if you remember back to some of the other bad drawings that I've done, basically the uterus sits here and the bladder is right in front of it and the rectum is right behind it. So if you had a fibroid that's located right in the right place and it's pressing into the bladder or right in the right place and it's pressing into the rectum, you could get urinary symptoms or constipation from fibroids. So those are the most common ways we see fibroids presenting. We also see a lot of asymptomatic or fibroids that are not causing any problems when we do prenatal ultrasounds and someone is pregnant. They're not usually very painful unless they are degenerating. Degenerating means losing their blood supply and that is extremely painful. So a dying fibroid can be really painful. Another way fibroids can be painful is that the submucosal ones like we were talking about that are on the inside of the uterus can very rarely, I've only seen it three or four times, start to basically deliver through the cervix and that is extremely painful, usually associated with lots of bleeding, lots of pain. People typically end up in the emergency room with that. Usually, if you're having pelvic pain and somebody says, oh, it's because you have a fibroid, 
I would challenge that idea unless they think this is an acute onset pain that's related to either the fibroid losing its blood supply or the fibroid prolapsing through the cervix, which you would know based on physical exam. I always get frustrated when I see fibroids being blamed for pelvic pain because unless it's bulk symptoms or it's heavy periods, painful periods, clotty periods, things like that, it's not usually going to be the culprit for pelvic pain. That's just my opinion. If you have fibroids and you've been told that that's the reason you have chronic pelvic pain, then certainly I don't know that I can challenge that having never seen you, but it always gives me pause when someone says that they've been told the reason for their chronic pelvic pain is fibroids. With regards to pregnancy, fibroids generally don't cause problems. Like I was saying earlier, one of the most common ways we find an asymptomatic fibroid is on a prenatal ultrasound. Rarely, they can be associated with pregnancy complications, and this typically directly correlates to the size of the fibroid. So we'll probably make sure that we do a few extra ultrasounds throughout the pregnancy to ensure that it's not getting larger or causing growth restriction in the baby. Having fibroids is super, super common. Having fibroids that cause pregnancy complications is super, super rare. So if you have a fibroid, even if it's very large and you're pregnant, try not to focus too much on it because most of the time, like almost all the time, it's fine. What about infertility? This is a harder question to answer because traditionally we have thought there was a huge association between infertility and fibroids. However, the literature on this and the science on this is a little bit varied and is sometimes a little inconclusive. There probably is some link to some fibroids and infertility. Like we were talking about earlier, fibroids can be located in many places and the place that they're located often dictates what kind of symptoms you have. A pedunculated fibroid or a subserosal fibroid is pretty unlikely to cause problems with getting pregnant. However, if a fibroid is looking on the very inner layer close to where the embryo would implant and start to grow, then maybe this could cause problems with trying to conceive. The correlation is pretty weak, meaning most people who have a fibroid don't have infertility and we often see it made as though someone has unexplained infertility and then we blame it on the fibroids. This is hard to study. So there probably is some link, but it's not exact. And the way I want you to approach this is that if you have a fibroid, you shouldn't be worried about infertility right now. Just wait and see when you're ready to get pregnant what your doctor has to say. If you have infertility and you also have a fibroid, talk to your doctor about the location of the fibroid and if they think that it might be related. It used to be thought that fibroids were highly associated with an increased risk of miscarriage, but these studies were pretty poorly done. They didn't control for the fact that as you get older, you're more likely to have a fibroid, and as you get older, you're more likely to have a miscarriage. So the data on this is even more confusing and more conflicting than the data on infertility. Are you guys learning yet that on this channel, I don't have an easy yes or no answer for almost any question that you ask? I just want you guys to like have the information and then talk to your doctor about it, ask questions, bring it up, get their thoughts, because it tends to be a very individual thing and risk analysis is a very individual case by case basis in my discussions. So what do you do about them? The dog is barking outside. That dog has absolutely no respect for the entertainment and education I am trying to provide to almost 500,000 subscribers. If you're not subscribed, hit subscribe, help us hit that milestone. Wow, that was really YouTubery. I am official, guys. The treatment of a fibroid, like pretty much everything else, is going to be based on what problems it is causing you. If you have a fibroid and you have no symptoms from it and we just randomly happen to see it, other than making sure it's not rapidly growing, which would be a concerning finding but is pretty uncommon, there's really nothing we need to do about it. It's not dangerous to leave it there. Some of them will go away over time. Some of them will just stay exactly the same and some of them can get bigger. Okay, so let's get rid of those people who are not having problems from their fibroids and talk about treatment of fibroids when we are having symptoms. This is going to vary based on what your fertility goals are. So if somebody has really large fibroids that are causing really bad, heavy periods, you can try to do medical treatment for that. That would be something like birth control pills. Sometimes people will use Depo-Provera, which is the injectable progesterone medication. And sometimes you will use an IUD. This 
is kind of controversial in fibroids because depending on the location of the fibroid, an IUD can be hard to put in or potentially at an increased risk of falling out. So again, it's a discussion with the patient, but those are kind of the basic medical treatments. Whether or not that helps someone is going to be dependent on them. And so I always tell the patient like, don't sit at home and suffer. If the medication or the treatment we try first isn't working, we need to figure out something else. Another medication that is sometimes used is called Lupron. And this is a GnRH agonist and it is given every three to six months. It's also used sometimes for endometriosis and can have some pretty severe side effects. I would never start with Lupron if we hadn't tried other things. So these are things we can use in someone who wants to preserve fertility or wants to avoid surgery. If someone has large fibroids that are causing symptoms, they also have the option of doing surgical management. One of those options would be a uterine artery embolization, which is less surgery and more procedure. Interventional radiologist goes in through the femoral artery and then identifies through imaging the uterine artery and includes part of that to basically decrease blood flow to the fibroid and cause it to degenerate and go away. If you want to preserve your fertility, meaning you might want to get pregnant again in the future, I would not recommend uterine artery embolization. And you should know that if you choose to go the route of uterine artery embolization, I would highly encourage you to have a reliable form of birth control because there are some serious complications that can come with pregnancy after UAE. There's a procedure called myomectomy, which is removal of the fibroid. And this is most often seen in that dog is driving me crazy. This is most often used in the fertility sphere of people who have large fibroids that they think may be contributing to trouble conceiving or recurrent miscarriages. It can be done through a large incision on the belly or through a minimally invasive laparoscopic approach or through the cervix for those submucosal ones that are closer to the inside, you can do it with what we call hysteroscopy, which is looking through the cervix and into the uterus with a camera and then taking the fibroid out that way, which is really cool. And then I briefly touched on hysterectomy, which is removal of the entire uterus. Obviously that would be in the same sphere with uterine artery embolization in that that shouldn't be done if somebody is anticipating that they would like to become pregnant in the future. That's fibroids in a nutshell. I hope that you learned something. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.